This is Aaron Kupferberg for PowerPapaholic.com, and today I'm talking with Richard X. Heyman. How are you today, Richard? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Good. The last time uh, we touched base with you was right after you released Actual Size, and since then you released Intakes, which was really a companion to Actual Size, songs from early in your career. Can you tell me your mindset after you released all this, what got you thinking about a pop opera in tears? Well, I guess it goes back to uh, the Peter Principle. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I've heard of it. When I was in college, I took a course uh, in nonsensical literature. And the first book we, we, we read was the Peter Principle. Uh, and the Peter Principle is in the hierarchy. Uh, every employee tends to rise to his level of incompetence. And uh, that's why the world is so screwed up, because everybody keeps rising up to do the thing that they weren't as good at before. So the thing that I do best in life is play drums. And then I uh, started to fool around with guitar and piano and, and songwriting and all that. Right. But I sort of got into this, not, I wouldn't call it a rut, but just sort of this groove where I was a guitar player, singer-songwriter, and uh, I play the piano much better than I play the guitar. And I've been meaning to do a piano album for years. And I just finally got a good electric piano that I really like to play and inspired me to write these songs. So I finally wound up doing the piano album. That's, that's sort of the mindset for this thing. So that's how Tears sort of came to be. Because I, I look, there's a lot of... I listen to it. There's a lot of piano melodies here. It's almost like a deliberate piano concerto in the way some of it's structured. Was that that was intentional? Well, what happened was I bought this Yamaha electric piano and I got it home. And as soon as I sat down, I wrote the first song that's on the album called uh, "Out on the Trail of Innocence." And from there, I just started writing like two or three songs a day. They were just kind of coming out of the piano. And it was almost like a magic piano that the songs were kind of writing themselves. And then a few songs into this, I realized, you know, I got a bit of a cough, so excuse me. That's right. I realized I was sort of uh, recounting the story of, of Nancy and I meeting. And then I took off for L.A. and tried to have the music industry out there. And then I ended up back in New York and we got back together again. So it's that whole story. And it was kind of just automatic. It just popped out with the songs. I wasn't really trying to do anything, and I just realized that's what it was. Right. Well, let, since we're still talking about the album, let me get to some specific tracks. Particularly, I'll talk about some of my favorites, like Golden in This Town. It just talks about the need to, to move on. It, it doesn't really say. It says in the beginning, stuff used to hold us down. But was something holding you down? I just didn't want to get tied down to any single person back then. You know, I was in my early 20s, and I was raring to go, and I had just met Nancy down in uh, Maryland, where I had migrated from New Jersey, and so it's kind of like a uh, combination of getting together and splitting apart song. Right. It, it, it's also, it's one of my favorites there. I just love the melody oh, uh, to you. it. Um, another one, The Game Stays the Same, that, that sort of talks about how you get to L.A. and you regret that you even got there, almost. I, I couldn't hear what you said. No, I, I was just going to say, did it, was there really that much disillusionment once you arrived on the West Coast? Um, yes and no. I mean, L.A. is great if you're successful and you have money and a nice car and you live that lifestyle. <laughs> but I, I found it... Uh, kind of tough when you're struggling. I didn't even have a car. That's how bad things were. Mm. And uh, the difference is like when you're in New York and you're struggling, you're out on the street with everybody else that's struggling and they're all walking around and everybody's kind of like got their head down and, and something about the uh, comfort in numbers, I guess. But when you're out in LA, you're so isolated. And if you're trying to get ahead and there's nobody around, you start to get a little depressed. And, and Right. Right. Well, uh, it's sort of like the, the whole arc of the story sort of ends with Only For You, which talks about the futility of the music business. And then the finish line, 
it seems so final. Like I'm taking my final bow uh, for all my friends. I mean, it almost says like this song, this album, this is my last, my last album. Um, is there more Richard X. Heyman to come after uh, I'm Tears? I'm actually working on a new album as we speak. Well, that's great to hear because yeah. after the last song on this one, I was like, "Wow, it seemed so like, final." <laughs> yeah, well, those, yeah, some of these are metaphoric, and some are uh, dealing with death, but you know, in kind of an abstract way, it's, it's relating to people I know that have died. You know, and, you know, you do contemplate your own death too. So the, the finish line is obviously about death. Yes, and it's just uh, truth be told, as mm-hmm. I started to uh, record the album, and I kept kidding myself, thinking that I was going to be able to fit this all into one disc. I just wanted to make a single album. Right. And songs were piling up. And we started to reject a lot of songs. You know, we, and, and Nancy's a very tough critic, so she was rejecting songs, and then there was one, there were songs I didn't like. So there was almost a whole album's worth of reject. Not, yeah, I hate to call it rejects, but just songs that we, we discarded for this project. I see. But, but these 30 songs were still ones we, that were in contention, and, and I kept thinking, I oh, will we'll squeeze them onto one album somehow, and, and you know, it was just like in denial. And then when we physically started to mix it, I realized how much time these songs are taking. I realized it's going to have to be a two-disc album, oh. but then I started to get the idea that they should be two sep- totally separate albums. I was going to just release them separately, but then just financially it was easier to just put them all in one package. Okay, great. Um, let me get a little bit uh, off this album, and let, let me talk about your time with the Doughboys. Uh, you've been touring with them for how long at this point, you think? Well, the Doughboys got back together again 10 years ago. Okay. So we've been for a decade now in the reunion stage, you know, but the, the original band was, was together when I was in... Uh, High right, right. So, but when you when you reunited with them and you started touring around with them, um, it was great because you were back on what you originally did, which was the drums, the drum right. set. And uh, how's it been touring around Jersey and New York uh, for the past? Uh, I love, you know, I love it. I love playing with the Doughboys. It's very high energy, kind of uh, garage rock style, and uh, it's been keeping me in shape physically to work out just to do an hour or an hour and a half whatever type of show we do. Yeah, I saw you at the IPO. You looked exhausted after the set. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, I say, it feels like I just played a football game or been hit, hit by a truck or something. Well, well it, it, you guys d- definitely did a great job on, on the last Doughboy album. Is another one uh, in the works? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're just working up songs now. We're, uh, we're, we're actually playing a George Harrison tribute show in a couple weeks, so... Excellent. We've been working up a set for that, so we've learned a bunch of really cool George Harrison songs that we're doing kind of in our garage rock style, and it's a very interesting com- combination. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, uh, let me take a little another little sidetrack. I-, I noticed on your bio on Wikipedia, it mentioned you actually did some drumming for the Left Bank's Michael Brown. Can you tell right. me a little bit about that experience? Well, what happened was, uh, I have a friend here in New York, his name's Alan Waters, and he gave me a call and he was playing bass with uh, Michael Brown on some uh, recordings and they recruited Steve Martin, the original lead singer from the left bank. Right. He was up in the city, New York City. Steve Martin Caro. And we got yeah. together and, uh, you know, started to uh, rehearse. I, I actually did a couple different things. I did some um, recordings with Steve Martin for different projects he was doing. But, you know, like some demo stuff with different singers trying out new material. And then there was this left bank reunion that never happened. We just did some rehearsing and then um, the, the whole thing fell apart. Mm. I, I wasn't even aware of what, what happened, but they, they just decided. What, around what year was this? Um, hold on, let me ask that. Hey, Dad, what year was I playing with Steve Martin and uh, you know, in, uh, left bank, Michael Brown? Yeah, sometime in the 80s, I think, but I don't know the exact year anymore. I mean, it's a thrill playing with Michael Brown because he wrote all those great songs, but the, the biggest thrill was hearing Steve Martin singing because he's, at least then, he sounded exactly the same as he did on the records, and he's kind of got probably just about the best voice for that kind of music I've ever heard. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Uh, he's just incredible voice. 
with this album out, are you going to, with, with Tears and other stories, are you going to be uh, touring it all, playing some of these songs at some point, or are you just going to... I don't really, I don't really have any plans for any live performances. We're going to do a... Uh, we're planning on doing a kind of like a dance recital with ballet. You know, with, we have a choreographer in mind, and we're going to rent a theater and have people, you know, dancers do some choreographed dance to some of the songs. And then one of the songs we're going to have uh, filmmakers do some kind of visual. Wow. Sounds like a so great little... Uh, multimedia presentation. Excellent. Excellent. When, when do you anticipate, roughly, that this is going to occur? Well, definitely not until the spring. I mean, we have to uh, get, we have to audition dancers. We've just put an ad out recently, and we're getting a good response. And then we're going to have to uh, get rehearsals going. So I, I can't really say exactly when it'll happen, but as soon as it's rehearsed and ready to go. Well, excellent. I, I'm glad to hear that this, uh, this project is taking <laughs> wing... In, uh, in other media, and, and it's sort of expanding out and, and eventually will have a, a full life of its own other than just as an album. Yeah, well, it was always, you know, as we were working on it, we, uh, I mean, it was always sort of like a theatrical vibe to the whole thing. That was the whole idea. Yes. A, a visual presentation, almost like a, a Broadway show, I and mean, that was the other idea. Um, so I guess that's really all the uh, questions I had. I wanted to thank you so much for your time. Best of luck on the new projects that are coming out uh, with yourself and the Doughboys, and we look forward to hearing more music from you in the future. We really yeah, like uh, this. Like I said, I'm right now I'm doing I'm back doing a real guitar, you know, a real guitar oriented pop album right now. So I'm a few songs into that. Excited about it because you know I got the whole piano thing out of my system for the time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks so much. And right, Aaron. Good talking to you. Great. Great talking to you, Richard. Take care. Thanks for the interest. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.